I have no idea how to start this video. I'm wearing a Joe Black t-shirt, which is kind of topical and on brand. I like Joe Black, she's a good queen. I've been very invested in trans rights for a long, long time, probably nearly a decade, ever since one of the writers on this list came out as transgender and I was already a fan of her. Suddenly I was involved in trans rights, suddenly I realised that I'd lived a life of gender dysphoria myself. Getting into trans rights, trans politics, the lives and culture of trans men and women has made me realise that I am a non-binary human being and that's really important to me. It's changed my entire life. So what I want to do here is take an article that I've already written and turn it into a video celebrating some of my favourite trans books by trans writers. All the books on this list are a blend of fiction and non-fiction by trans women and trans men. They are all also about being trans. Although it's a bit of a clunky title, trans books by trans authors is the only way that I can be entirely truthful and clear. Every writer on this list is a transgender man or woman, and all of these books are fiction or non-fiction about being transgender in some way. So this is about representation. Representation of the transgender community, an element of the queer community that I am very, very, very much personally invested in, and I want to see trans people get better representation and trans authors are part of that fight. So let's dig in. I should also say up front that I just finished reading Detransition Baby and that is the main reason I decided to make this video now. It is very likely that this video is pretty much gonna be 50% this and 50% all the other books on the list. Detransition Baby is written by Tori Peters. I didn't know that this book existed until it was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction 2021. It has made history for being the first book on the Women's Prize for Fiction written by a trans woman. That's really exciting. As the prize name indicates, it is a piece of fiction and I've done a video on the Women's Prize. When I made the video, I hadn't even heard of Tori Peters I had not bought this book. I since have bought and finished it recently and it is fantastic. I didn't, I assumed I would like it. I didn't know how much I was gonna like it and I absolutely love it. Trans representation aside, this is very, very simply an astonishingly well plotted book. It's amazing how well plotted this is. It is meticulously planned out. It feels like the plans for this book could have looked something like a bank heist where everything is so meticulously detailed and planned out and every eventuality is accounted for to make sure that the plans go ahead and in the end everything succeeds and everybody wins. It's so detailed in its plotting. Detransition Baby follows the lives of two people living in Brooklyn. One of them is a trans woman named Reese. Reese is about 35 years old, she's in her mid 30s. And she used to be in a lesbian relationship with another trans woman called Amy. Amy has since that relationship detransitioned because she was beaten up in the street and she felt vulnerable and she felt afraid and she detransitioned. And now she goes by Ames, or I should say he. <laughs> he goes by Ames. Pronouns are a complicated thing sometimes, and they are particularly complicated in this book, but the book never allows them to be. So we have Ames, a formerly transgender woman who is now living as a man. Ames has accidentally knocked up his boss, Katrina. Katrina is a 39-year-old woman of Chinese and Jewish blood. Her father was a Jewish migrant, her mother was a Chinese migrant, and she grew up right out in the sticks of Vermont. And now they all live in New York City. Katrina got knocked up because Ames thought that he was infertile. He spent six years as a trans woman and assumed that all of that time spent taking estrogen meant that his testicles shriveled up and that he no longer was fertile. And that turned out to not be true. So now Katrina is pregnant and Ames is the father, but neither of them really feel ready to be parents. And so Ames makes a pretty strange leap of calling up his ex-girlfriend, Reese, who has spent her entire life desperate to be a mother, but as a trans woman cannot carry children of her own. And Ames reaches out to her and says, hey, I know we haven't talked in a while and we've been broken up for like two, three years, but would you like to be part of this three-way parenting relationship between me, you, and my boss, Katrina, who I accidentally knocked up. Weird situation, but it does certainly represent a new angle of parenthood. There are so many different ways 
of being a parent and raising a child, adopting children, fostering children, being a gay or lesbian couple raising a child, and this is just another avenue. And that's an interesting thing in and of itself, as weird a situation as it is. So the book, from this moment on, splits its time up between the past and the present. Pretty much every other chapter goes back and forth between Katrina's pregnancy and her, Ames and Reese all kind of getting to know each other and deciding what exactly they're going to do with this strange parenting relationship, while also exploring Ames. I think Ames is the most interesting character here. It explores his time as a trans woman, his detransitioning, and his life now in terms of his psychology. He has so much regret and so much vulnerability and so much fear and confusion, and he really, all the way through the book, whether it's past or present, still feels like a confused child, and you really do feel sorry for him. But at the same time, he's not always nice to the people around him. Reese is the most obvious example. You don't know how to feel about him, you know, he's, he's such a human character. We all have friends who Sometimes we feel sorry for them, sometimes we feel like we love them, or sometimes we feel like we hate them. Some people we just kind of want to slap, and yet you can't slap Ames, and you do feel sorry for him, and you do respect him. It's a complicated relationship between the reader and the, and the character, and a lot of authors don't really let us have such a complex relationship. Quite often an author has a very specific idea in mind of who a character is, and we have to just kind of accept who that character is, it's very very clear, and we know how we're supposed to feel about them. Ames is different. Ames is complicated. You go back and forth, back and forth on him. Very, very interesting person. And that moving through time from six years ago to three years ago to the present really, really fleshes him out. And it does for Reese as well. She is, in some ways, our protagonist. If you had to pick one of them, I guess Reese is more, more the protagonist. I don't really know how to justify that, but she certainly seems that. And I think it's because her character is a little less complicated, so she's easier to latch on to. She's a trans woman, and she's a very confident person who has learned to build up this confidence, partly as a shell in order to survive, because it's a harsh world out there, and partly just because that's who she is. She's not quite as complicated. She's less layered than Ames. In the past, sometimes we see Ames as Amy, and sometimes we see even pre-Amy. There's, there's a wonderful chapter that deals with Ames when she was Amy and before she was Amy. This is really, really interesting. This is when it's that egg moment where she understands that she is a trans woman. She is going by Amy, at least in her mind, but she is still entirely masculine presenting. Her family, etc., are all calling her by her birth name and calling her by her birth gender, and yet the narrator, the author, the story itself is telling us that she is Amy. But this is Amy at age of like 17, 18 years old, getting into really, really difficult relationships with people who are teaching through sex and gender some kind of difficult and harsh truths that Amy wasn't ready to learn, but she's still discovering herself nonetheless. And at this time, as I said, you know, she is male presenting, but she is still Amy. And then after the detransition, he is Ames. And so it's almost like pre-transition Amy was always Amy, but detransition Ames is a man called Ames. At the same time, it feels like that's what he's telling us, that's what he wants us to think. And all the way through the book, in the present tense bits, when Ames is now a man, Ames, Reese refers to him as Amy, and sometimes uses she, her pronouns. And sometimes it feels like it's, she does it out of anger, because she's frustrated at Ames for detransitioning and becoming a different person. Other times, it's like a Freudian slip, and also it feels like she's doing it because she knows that deep in his heart, Ames is still a woman. There are moments where she remarks that Ames still walks and talks like a woman. So Ames has so much going on inside his head. So much dysphoria, so much confusion, so much self-hatred. Fascinating character. I could talk about Ames forever, honestly. I think I've lost my way a little bit. I knew that I'd spend like 10 minutes just talking about this book, and you can't not. The story of Reese and Ames and Katrina deciding what to do about this pregnancy and how to be parents as this strange trio, especially when Katrina and Reese never knew each other before. It's weird, and it's an interesting framing device, but what's far more important is how Tori Peters, in Detransition Baby, is looking at the disparate lives of trans women. The book does not shy away from the really harsh and dark truths of trans people. It throws in statistics when it comes to murder statistics, homelessness, the fact that black 
trans women are so at risk of suicide, murder, homelessness. It's tragic. And the book definitely really digs into issues of class and race and privilege and labour as well. And there's a very, very deep emphasis at one point on suicide. The fact that, you know, there are jokes about trans people getting together at funerals because there's always a funeral, there's always a suicide within trans communities. And it's gut-wrenching and it makes you cry. But at the same time, the book is funny. Tori Peters has this really, really raw and sardonic wit about her. She is hilarious. This book is, at times, laugh-out-loud funny. And you wouldn't think that because it's so bleak. But it is. It, it's, it's funnier than not funny. It's funny more often than it's tragic. And very, very well these things are balanced. As I said, Tori Peters is a master plotter. She is so good at meticulously plotting out this book, but that doesn't just mean the story. She's plotting out the lives of these characters so completely. They are living, breathing people. And that also goes for the tone. She is plotting out the humour, the tragedy, balancing this, this comic and tragic weighing scale situation. She so perfectly blends and balances these things and allows them to breathe. It is a absolute magical mix of comedy and tragedy and drama and facts and statistics. You know, at times it feels like a non-fiction because it's hitting us with so many truths tragic truths about modern life for a transgender person. It's really an amazing piece of fiction. This is a truly remarkable novel and I urge everyone to read it. Two books I want to talk about now are both by British trans women. One is Mia Violet and her book Yes You Are Trans Enough and the other is Laura Kate Dale and her book Uncomfortable Labels. Yes You Are Trans Enough is a memoir and a book that tackles misinformation. It is as the title suggests, Mia Violet exploring her own journey as a trans woman and speaking out to other trans people, other people who are going through struggles of gender identity and promising them that, yes, you are trans enough. So Mia Violet is a writer and blogger and author from the UK. This book represents her journey and it very much speaks to the journeys of other trans people. It very much digs into misinformation, as I already said. It talks about the media and how information is skewed and twisted when it comes to trans people. It kind of tries to break down the ideas of fear, anger, confusion, aggression when it comes to the relationship between trans people and cis people and how that stuff is all stirred up by the media and bad representation. This is a book that was written with love. It is Mia Violet loving herself as a trans woman. It is her telling you to love yourself as a trans person, if you are one. And it is her trying to tell us that trans people deserve love, and here's why. It's a very uplifting book. Yeah, it, it's, it has underpinnings of sorrow and tragedy because that's the real life that trans people live through, but it's a book of hope and love, first and foremost. And Mia is also a very witty and fun and accessible writer. The other very, very similar book by a British trans woman is Uncomfortable Labels by Laura Kate Dale. I've actually been a fan of Laura Kate Dale for a long time. She is a fantastic video games journalist. She used to write for Kotaku UK. She has been a regular on Jim Sterling's Podquisition podcast since the beginning. She's awesome. And she's an amazing orator. She's very, very good at expressing information really clearly. She doesn't waffle. She's so good at using the exact words when she needs to use them, whether she's speaking or writing. It's amazing how concise she is. She's really good at expressing herself. And of course, that makes for a really compelling memoir. Uncomfortable Labels is her life as a trans woman, but also her life as a person on the autism spectrum. So it's about realizing a lot about herself, including and beyond being a trans woman. It talks about how difficult it is being on the autism spectrum, going through school, and going through your early 20s. It's a book of self-discovery and it's, it's mostly a very, very intensely personal journey. Although this is a book that can teach confused, gender dysphoric people all sorts about themselves, it does that through empathy for Laura herself. That's the only way I can really describe it. It is, it is a narrative journey through Laura's life as a trans woman, as an autistic person, and you will learn a lot about her along the journey, while also learning a lot about trans people in general, and a lot about autism, which is not why I initially read the book, but also as an ex-teacher who used to deal a lot with children on the autism spectrum, 
it was really fascinating to have even things that I was taught as a trainee teacher kind of thrown away and realizing that that information is kind of out of date. It's because it's coming from the horse's mouth and that's really important. So any teachers out there who think they understand the signs of autism and how to help autistic children, read this book because there's a lot you might not know. You can see the title of the next book on the screen here and that should probably tell you why I can't say it out loud. The title of this book is a slur. The reason the title of this book is a slur, as far as I know, is because its writer, Laura Jane Grace, is a punk. She is a legend of the punk music scene and is a punk rock star, has been for years and years now, and so it's a very punk thing to do to take a slur and try to repurpose it and scream it and internalize it and reclaim it and and repurpose it for something that is good. This is not a new idea, but it does mean that I can't say the name of the book out loud. I also am not sure if calling this book this name does it many favors. In fact, in Detransition Baby, Tori Peters comes for this book. There is a moment in the book about halfway through, I think, where the characters are walking through Brooklyn and suddenly they just see a poster on a brick wall with this word written on it. And there's not really any other information. And then someone realizes, oh, this isn't an attack on the trans community of Brooklyn. This is an advert for this book and a musical tour by Laura Jane Grace. So she actually gets kind of called out in Detransition Baby. They mention in the book, I can't remember what they say. Basically, you know, privileged people who get to transition have never heard that term before because they already come from a place of respect. They're already on a higher tier, if you like, in terms of their, their class and their position in, in public life. And so they never get to hear that word, whereas ordinary trans people on the ground hear that word all the time. And it's not fair that Laura Jane Grace has done this with the name of her book. It's fiction, you know, it's, it's, it's in fiction, it's what the characters in the novel are saying. It's an interesting point. And as a big fan of Laura Jane Grace, I was struck by that moment and I did laugh. And it's a really valid point. But anyway, this is still a really, really good book that is worth reading. Although, of course, I am biased because I can't overstate how much of a fan of Laura Jane Grace I am. I've been a fan of her band Against Me for years. I saw them live before she came out as transgender. I haven't had a chance to see them since, even though their album... Transgender Dysphoria Blues is one of my favorite albums of all time. I still listen to it constantly, which is weird for me because I'm always listening to new music and forget that old music exists. So that album was a really big deal for me. And then she brings out this book, which is another book like Mia Violet's book, like Laura Kate Dale's book. This is a personal memoir. It is a journey about becoming an out and out trans woman and telling the world your story and your narrative and your truth. I love Laura Jane Grace. I love Against Me. I love everything that she does. I'm not sold on the title. It has bothered me ever since it was announced, but the book is still worth reading and Laura Jane Grace's personal story is an amazing one. It's fascinating. It's really, really interesting personal narrative from a person who is already famous and having to transition in the public eye. That's, that's perhaps what sets this apart from other books, other trans memoirs and trans narratives by trans writers, is that she was already famous and that presents unique privileges and unique struggles at the same time. Fascinating book. The last book I want to talk about has the best title of all the books on this list, and it is called Transmission, My Quest to a Beard. The book's written by a trans man called Alex Bertie, and you can tell from the cover and from the title that this is a slightly more jovial and positive book. As I said, Mia Violet's Yes You Are Trans Enough is a positive book, but it is still peppered with sad truths of the world. This book is a little bit more jovial and sweet and witty and, uh, and, and, and really tries to keep that positive energy all the way through. Alex Bertie is a pretty prominent trans guy. He remarks that he knew that he was trans from around the age of 15, and this is his journey to becoming what he is. It's difficult to put that into words, isn't it? But this is him just trying to explore his truth and write it down. So it's very similar to Yes You Are Trans Enough and Uncomfortable Labels, but it does seem at times like there are, and I don't know if this is my bias or just my echo chamber, I have no idea, but it does often seem like not only do transphobes and TERFs come more for trans women and therefore trans women are more at risk, and I think the statistics 
also prove that, but I'm not sure 100%. It does also seem that a lot of trans activists are trans women more than trans men. I can certainly name a lot more. I don't know why that is. I think if you're going to read books by trans people on trans issues, it's more likely that you'll stumble upon books by trans women than by trans men. And I have a lot of ideas as to why, and I don't want to waffle on about them, but just for that reason alone, it's important to read Transmission. Also, as I said, because the title is so clever and witty and fun, I love puns. Love puns. Transmission is a very, very witty, sweet, lovable book that is about personal exploration in a mostly happy and charming way, and Alex writes with a lot of wit and wisdom. I also have no idea how to end this. I didn't know how to start it and I don't know how to end it. This is just a handful of books by trans writers that have inspired me, that have educated me, that can inspire you and educate you. If you're a young person who isn't sure of their gender, you're a little egg who's a little confused, and you just need a little support figuring yourself out, then these are trans books by trans writers that can help you. If you are a parent whose child is transgender, if you're a teacher with students who are transgender, or if you're just an ordinary cis person who wants to know more about the journeys, the lives, the struggles, and the existence of trans people in our everyday society, then you need to read some of these books. They will teach you a lot, whether they're fiction or not, whether they're written by a trans woman or a trans man, they're going to teach you an incredible amount, and they're going to unlock a lot of personal sympathy and empathy, and we need even more of these. We need more books by trans men and trans women. All right, that'll do it. We recently had a whole wave of subscribers coming into the YouTube channel. I've already said that our YouTube channel is supplementary and our main website is where most of our writing is, and therefore, if you're a fan of the channel, please check out our writing on our main site, booksandbow.com. And if you want to support us even more and you love what we're trying to do by championing books that you might not have heard of or come across before, then please consider subscribing to our Patreon because you'll get even more from us, and you'll be supporting us, and we always need support. And, as always, subscribe for books.